good evening everyone for the last talk of our day one session we have dr seema alam from ilbs new delhi she'll be talking on acute on chronic liver failure dr seema is professor and head of pediatric hepatology at ilbs new delhi she is controller of examinations academics and head operations medical ma'am has several achievements to her credit and i welcome her for her talk on aclf ma'am please so i at the outset i thank the uh, organizers is again for this topic pediatric aclf in 2021 so yes next slide please so the outline i will describe as the concept of a, of the definition whether it's the apacel definition vis-a-vis -vis the cliff so far different definition both of them how do they really work this is what is important for us to understand the acute and the chronic insult in pediatric aclfs the common ones and the issues that are there in the definition of with pediatric aclf that this this is important for us to understand and finally the prognostic models which help us in in uh, managing these patients i would not go into the details of management because of the lack of time to uh, complete that so next slide please now when we talk about the definition of a passel definition of ap a, a, you know aclf it's an acute hepatic insult which manifests at, as jaundice and coagulopathy and is complicated within 4 weeks by ascites and or hepatic encephalopathy in a patient with previously diagnosed or undiagnosed chronic liver disease now the scenario where aclf was decided to be brought in was uh, was the time when there was a lot of definitions for acute liver failure were going on there was an hyper acute definition and a sub acute definition and an acute de definition so to bring them all together and to uh, be able to see as to what are the patients who are more sick and need management and in a time bound manner aclf was uh, brought in as a definition and they decided that since 50% of all patients of aclf die within 4 weeks so the complications of ascites and encephalopathy should happen within 4 weeks to say to to identify the cases who may have a high, higher likelihood of mortality in this group next slide please yes so now to understand who are these patients who may have this acute insult so if you have a normal liver you have an acute insult in that you the patient will land up into an acute liver failure but if the patient has a spectrum from chronic liver disease to a decompensated cirrhosis if if such patients have acute insult what will happen in them so let's take one by one if it's just a chronic liver disease or a compensated cirrhosis a past some some uh, some or the first uh time when this uh, the cirrhosis has had the first insult so a compensated cirrhosis and a chronic liver disease who's yet not become a cirrhosis if they have an acute insult they will land into something called as acute chronic liver failure with jaundice and coagulopathy and then complicating with ascites or he if a patient whether it's compensated cirrhosis or decompensated cirrhosis but if there has been a previous decompensation then in that case these patients are going to go into a, a multiple sepsis and hrs uh, uh, you know combinations of various uh, you know fail, uh, organ failures and will will keep on worsening till they have sepsis bleed and aka and may die so this is a separate group the 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 patients who result in acute liver failure are the patients who are likely to have some reversibility and they, hence they are important to you know catch them at this point so it's a homogeneous definition of uh, a passel definition of a aclf is more homogeneous whereas if you see the cliff so far they cover all these these cases who may have any kind of whether it's uh, you know acute insult in a chronic liver disease in a compensated cirrhosis in a decompensated cirrhosis all these are covered under cliff so far and hence cliff so far definition and hence it's a more heterogeneous definition and that is why uh, i think a passel definition is more easier to understand and we will go by the passel definition from here onwards next slide please to understand better the passel definition the idea is that if, you, if what is the amount of 
hepatic reserve that the patient is having vis-a-vis -vis the timeline. So if you see the x-axis here, the, uh, the y-axis here has the hepatic reserve. So if the hepatic reserve is 100%, you have an acute insult, this patient goes into ALF, like I told you below, and among them, so, some of them may improve and have complete potential of reversibility, complete reversibility. Whereas ACLF, where the hepatic reserve is not really 100, it's not optimal, it is lower, these patients, when they have an in insult, they go down and may have even irreversibility or by, by the time when they just have liver failure, not other uh, multi-organ failure, there is, a there is a therapeutic window that you can see here with a green uh, arrow. And that therapy in between this therapeutic window, there is a potential for these. If there is intervention there, then there's, there's a potential for reversibility in this ACLF patients. Whereas if you see the patients, uh, that is the DCLD, that's a yellow line, uh, they seem to go down with the acute insult and then they go down with multiple multi-organ failure and mortality. They don't seem to have any reversibility. So it's important point to make here is that ACLF are patients who have high mortality, but they also have a therapeutic window and have a, have a potential for reversibility. And hence, these patients should be identified so that we can make the intervention and save these patients. Next slide. Um, yes, so this slide shows the, again, the difference between apacil and easel. Some bit about the pathogenesis of uh, ACLF. Initially, there is no SERS inflammatory, uh, this thing, um, you know, uh, systemic inflammation. Then there is SERS present in these patients. Then they go in to have immunoparalysis, then sepsis, and then shock. Now, if you see the apacil definition, it actually tells you that the window period is largely in the first seven, 14 days. And this is the time which Apacil is covering. Whereas easel is not covering this. Easel definition does not cover this time because easel definition talks about only or, or extra hepatic organ failures, which usually happen during the later part of the illness. And by that time, it's too late for these patients to have any reversibility. So this is again an, an, another important difference between the two definitions. Go ahead, please. So the ARC data, that is the uh, PASIL consortium data, has almost 1,844 cases, and they have seen that the reversibility in of even fibrosis is there in 70% of the survivors who come by 90 days. So those who survive by 90 days from ACLF may have a reversibility even of fibrosis. The INR improves within seven days of these patients if they are going to go for, uh, become survivors. The bilirubin improves within 21 days if they are going to become survivors. And, but, at the same time, we must also remember that those patients who've had a prior decompensation, this is not the first decompensation for them. These are the patients who are possibly not ACLF. They are recent, uh, they are confused with recent worsening and they, so these patients should not be taken up. So the ACLF definition does not partake patients who've had prior decompensation. Next slide, please. Now for pediatric ACLF, we know that 14% of all pediatric CLD, 10 to 14% may land up with ACLF. The profile is different from the adults. We'll just discuss high short-term mortality, even in these patients, but little less than that of the adults, 40 to 60% by 90 days. Often the first event is 70 to 5% or 75 to 100% is present in the unknown, undiagnosed CLD. Next slide, please. See, if you go about and look at the various, uh, you know, please, one more slide, one more click. Okay, one more click. Sorry. So these are the five articles which are there in the PubMed search. If you look for pediatric acute liver failure, acute and chronic liver failure, pertaining the ap apacel definition. And three of them are from our own center. So just to uh, introduce you to these articles, in the next slide, please. So these articles together, they tell you that the mean age of these patients is around the end of the first decade. Previously diagnosed CLDs are usually very small in number percentage in these patients. Most of them are unknown CLDs. Bilirubin is uh, high, ranging from 12 to 21 percent. INR is pretty high, you know, hovering around three. Uh, or so. Ascitis HE, of course, ascitis is present in almost 100%, but HE may be present in two-thirds of these cases. And the survival, like I told you earlier, is between 40, 40 to 60% by 90 days. So, uh, yes, next slide. Yeah. 
So if we look at the underlying CLDs in pediatric acute liver failure, Wilson's is the commonest one. Next comes the autoimmune. And of course, the other causes are, are, are just after that. And this has been, been seen in almost all uh, data that has been discussed uh, in the literature. Next slide. As far as the acute event in pediatric ACLF is concerned, it's the commonest is the viruses, the hepatotrophic viruses, and then comes the drug, as well as the flare of the disease concern, whether it's autoimmune or Wilson's, the flare of the disease has also been seen to be very commonly seen as an acute event in these cases. Next slide, please. Among the viruses, the commonest virus has been seen to be uh, HAV. Next slide, please. But it has been noticed very clearly that no cholestatic liver disease or metabolic liver disease seem to be presenting as ACLF in, in our, in, at least from our data that we presented from ILBS. Now, what to do about the disease flare? How to define it? It seems to be present in autoimmune in 99.6 to 25%. As a Wilson's flare, it is about 25%. Another click, please. <clears throat> but, uh, and, and when we tried to look at the Wilson's flare and how does it, how do those patients fare? We found that the patients who uh, of ACLF who come with the, with the Wilson's flare seem to do the worst. So it is important for us to define these uh, flares before we go ahead. Next slide, please. Yes, so the statement from the Apastel ACF Consortium, the last one held in 2019, says that the pediatric ACLF is, un, is not uncommon. The more common underlying liver disease in ACLF in children is Wilson's disease and autoimmune liver disease. The more common acute precipitating events are the viruses and the uh, underlying or the uh, flare of the underlying disease. But a standard, go back, please. But a standardized definition of the disease flare is needed, which is still not available with us. Next slide, please. Now, there are very frequently we ask questions about whether sepsis or variceal bleed is an acute insult. Now, first, let's take up sepsis. The, the idea behind sepsis is that sepsis doesn't cause acute parenchymal insult. And hence, if it is not causing acute parenchymal insult, sepsis can cause organ failure even in other cirrhotics without causing a direct hepatic derangement. So hence, sepsis may present in a, in a, in a cirrhotic without acute parenchymal insult, and, and so it is not called an acute hepatic insult. We, uh, we similarly, if you look at the variceal bleed, why don't we consider mostly it, uh, variceal bleed as an acute insult is because that if variceal bleed happens in decompensated CLD, it may cause acute insult and cause liver failure. But if it is happening in a compensated unknown CLD, it, it may just unmask the CLD, but it may not cause liver failure. And so variceal bleed is very often not the acute precipitating event in most patients who are underla underlying compensated CLD. And that is a variceal bleed is not a common acute precipitating event. Next slide, please. Now, if we try to see as to what is the pediatric acute, acute liver failure vis-a-vis -vis the adult ACLF, uh, we, what we find is that the organ failures do happen in pediatrics, but a little less common. They are, the numbers are much less, and 50% may not have any organ failures at all. The outcome is also slightly better in these patients. By uh, 28 days, 65% are still surviving. And by 90 days, somewhere between 40 to 60% are still surviving. So reason could be, one, that we are treating, we mostly have underlying treatable diseases. And other reason could be that the adult patients have a lot of comorbidities, which are not present in pediatric ACLF. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. So the outcome of etiology of these patients, like I'm just telling you, is worst in Wilson's disease. And this is for us to note that it's the Wilson's disease ACLF who, who will mostly be part of your mortality and even the cryptogenic ACLF. Next slide, please. So the statement here that came from the consortium was that the short-term outcome is poor in approximately 33% of the pediatric ACLF subjects. One or more extra hepatic organ failures are seen in around half of these children and acute kidney injury and grade three to four HE are the most common extra hepatic organ failures. Half of the cases of ACLF have AKI. The presence of AKI increases the risk of poor outcome by several folds in these cases. Next slide, please. 
So do we need a modified definition? Why do we need a modified definition? Then let's just look at these patients. Just click once more. Can the bile atresia present as pediatric acellar? Why not? Why can't a successful KP who doesn't have pre-existing jaundice present as you know, uh, as uh, ACLF. And this is what has not been included in the definition as yet. Because in the adult definition, they do not include pre-existent uh, jaundice. So that is the reason why they have not taken up these patients here. Because our patients, mostly those who are unsuccessful KP, will have jaundice. But the successful KP may not have jaundice and may have suboptimal hepatic reserve and can have risk of acute insults. So we should they can present as ACLF, but how do they present as ACLF? Next slide, please. One of her cases of biliatresia, next slide, uh, was having a normal jaundice because he had a successful Kasai, but developed HEV infection and landed into a typical picture of ACLF. If you can, that you can see with these two rising uh, bilirubin, uh, you know, graph as well as of the INARS graph. So, so ACLF is possible in biliatresia. Next slide. But the consortium felt, but next slide. But the consortium felt that as cholangitis is not currently accepted as a parenchymal insult, this being just like any other sepsis, which happens which is, happens to be the most important, even leading to decompensation in biliatresia, the experts decided to exclude biliatresia from ACLF definition. So I think pediatric ACLF needs to think about biliatresia and how to maybe collect more data and then go forward and uh, try to uh, get a change in the definition to include biliatresia there. So the existing definition of ACLF cannot be used to diagnose, okay, let's go, go uh, the consortium felt that we should generate more multi-centric data from prospective studies to decide about this. Next slide. Now, as far as pediatric ACLF is concerned, you see that children less than three years are just 8.7% in the complete cohort. Why is it so? This is, although the, def, the death is almost 25% even in these cases, but why is it that we don't have enough number of younger children in the ACLF cohort is one, one must try to understand. Next slide, please. The, def, the various issues with younger children could be that we are not able to diagnose the HE and ascites in the time period that is required. Most of them have metabolic liver disease, the younger children, and they may not, they may have liver failure, but without increased bilirubin, and they may have very prolonged jaundice to encephalopathy intervals. And this could be the reason that they don't result in ACLF. They could be, uh, they, they, they have acute insults, which are less common in younger children. So all these three, uh, you know, things have need to be understood first. Next slide, please. So are we, and another click, please. Are we identifying the HE and the ascites? Another click, please. The HE pretty late. This is what it would appear like, that it may be present, but we are not able to identify, and hence it uh, goes beyond the 28 days period of the definition. Next slide, please. So should we look for HE um, sure, because it is difficult to look for HE in children, can we just increase the INR? Uh, one more click, please. Can we just increase the INR to two in the definition? And then with, with or without HE, we may just be able to take up all the cases. So because we, we, we can see it here, the irrespective of the INR, the identification of HE is very vital for the diagnosis and prognosis of pediatric so if we take INR to be two, uh, we in, in the definition, we may or may not pick up HE, but we may pick up all those cases uh, because they may be having uh, subclinical HE, which we are not being able to pick up. So maybe that change will definitely include more cases from under three years, which will then identify more cases of ACLF where we can concentrate more and maybe bring down the mortality in these cases. Next slide, please. So can we change the cutoff to more than two, regardless of the H is one question that I, we should raise here. Next slide. Can we use ammonia as a surrogate marker of H? The problem with, by using ammonia is because ammonia has different levels for different ages. Uh, hyperammonemia levels are different, cutoffs are different for different ages. So that is the problem that we'll face here. Next slide, please. 
when we try to look at our own data and try to see if HE, uh, ammonia can be a surrogate marker for HE, we found the AU ROC to be very low, 0.64, with a sensitivity very low and a specificity of just about 70%. So we don't think ammonia is a very good surrogate marker for HE. Next slide, please. Yes, when we looked at the, the ascites, clinical ascites vis-a-vis -vis the radiological ascites, we found that almost 27% of our cases having radiological ascites, but we were missing them in the clinical part. And hence, it is possible that if we use, or we also add up the radiological ascites in these cases, we may pick up more cases of ACLF from our cohort. Next slide, please. So the statement here that they agreed with is the existing definition of ACLF can be, can be continued to use in children. Clinical diagnosis of HE is often difficult in younger children. However, identification of HE is important for diagnosis and prognosis of pediatric ACLF. For older children, West Haven classification can be used. And for children less than three years, modified HE assessment scale can be used. They've still not agreed to the INR of two. And clinical and radiological ascites should be used for defining. So they're agreed to also including radiological ascites in the definition should be used for defining acute and chronic liver failure in children. Next slide, please. So why none of the non-Wilsonian MLDs are really De developing pediatric ACLF. Like I told you, they have a long J interval and that is causing a delayed identification of these patients. Next slide. Why are the MLDs not having pediatric ACLF? One more reason why, because most of them are smaller children and these smaller children do not have the acute insults in form of HAV. Like we've seen from our own, own uh, data that those who had HAV less than five years were just 15%. So in the less than five years, even Delhi was just in 27%. So is it that these acute insults are not happening in young children as often, and hence they are not, the, the MLDs or the younger children are not, younger SCLDs are not becoming ACLF. We have to see more data to decide this. Next slide, please. So which are the prognostic scores or models which will help in prognosticating the pediatric ACLF? Next slide, they have been, there have been a series of prognostic models which have been used. The model which is at the top and the best is the RKCLF, uh, which has been uh, which has been published by uh, Chaud Ashok Chaudhary from ILBS. So we use this RKCLF, uh, you know, and we used it. So Cliff so far and RKCLF come very close in prognosticating ACLF. We'll go forward now. Next slide, please. So the RKCLF is the best. Um, uh, prognostic score to be utilized in even in pediatric ACLF. Next slide, please. And this was seen in one of the studies that we, we published ourselves. The survival curve was very good for patients with ARC ACLF below 11, and which has been seen here as well. Next slide, please. The ARC ACLF between day zero to day four of the of developing ACLF. In non-survivors, the ARC ACLF keeps on going above from 11, whereas in survivors, the ARC ACLF keeps on going down. So it's a good uh, model to prognosticate these patients. Next slide. The statement is ARC ACLF is the best uh, dynamic prognostic model. And it can, if a patient's score is more than 11, it needs urgent listing and evaluation for liver transplant. And pediatric modification of these scores may be just as useful, but even the adult score worked very well. Next slide. So I conclude 14% of CLD present as ACLF in a tertiary led LT center. Wilson's disease and autoimmune are the common underlying chronic insult, whereas viruses in Delhi are the common acute insult. 50% will have at least one organ failure, and AKI is the commonest organ failure. RKCLF is the most effective prognostic score. Mortality by two, 28 days is 35%, and, and by 90 days, it is a, roughly between 50 to 60%. The unanswered questions in, in uh, pediatric ACLF are that the disease flare as an acute event is still not having a de standardized definition. And the ACLF in biliatresia and MLD and in younger children, we need more prospective multi-center data to decide why is it not happening or is it that we are not picking them up in time? Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am.